glory. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. Shout amen real quick, amen. High five, five to 10, 15 people. Before you take your seat, welcome to church. If you have your Bible, you can crack it open, Luke chapter 7, as we continue to study the Word of God together. I want to warmly welcome you to Love Church. If we haven't met, my name is Todd Doxson, one of the pastors here, and want to just celebrate Jesus with you today. It's really that simple. Also want to once again say happy Independence Month, it feels like. I don't know about you, they've been blowing off fireworks for the last two weeks, I think, in my neighborhood. Anybody? Same, same thing, and a lot to be, to be grateful for. I wanna welcome our very first time guest. Can you just wave at me? This is your first time here. Just wanna make sure I welcome you. I love, the, yeah, the point, the point right there. Anybody else? Um, how about this? First time guests who love to golf, or top golf. Maybe you don't have no game, but you wanna have a burger and wax, yeah? All right, jo Pastor Josh, you do me a favor. This, this lady keeps on pointing to this guy Right back here, I love it. So, sir, receive that from God through us, man. Go grab a burger, even if you don't like golfing. There's a good chunk of money on that, so thanks for being with us. Um, also, a first time guest who likes Starbucks. Anybody like Starbucks, first time? First time, is it your first time? Come on, what's your name? Angie? Rachel, can you bring that to Angie? Everybody welcome Angie real quick. Thanks for being with us, so cool, love it. We, uh, we really are a simple church. Our heart from day one is just to help as many people as, as we could. Denise and I, my wife, left Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 2008 in February when it was negative like 20 here in 84, literally on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. But there was a mission. God had forgiven us. He had um, completely changed our life. And I grew up in an environment where I thought God was a big ogre in the sky. Church was a, a religious duty. I never knew that you could read the Bible and actually get to know God for who he says he is. And so we've been on a mission for, uh, golly, 16 plus years to help people. So that's really it. We've been reading through the Bible in four years. We're in the book of Luke, which is an account of the life of Christ by Dr. Luke. And it's, uh, it's been amazing. And I also wanted to mention Love Church North Omaha is starting on August 11, by the way. Super excited. Live worship, live Bible teaching. I, I actually was just meeting with one of our pastors we're adding to our teaching team this week. So excited about what he's doing, how he's been preparing the way. And so man, you have people, friends in North Omaha, let them know a Love Church location, August 11. We're gonna actually throw a big block party with a bide the day before give away backpacks, it's gonna be a phenomenal time. So, um, super, super stoked. But let's get into the word, man. Y'all ready for the word of God? Luke chapter seven, I'm stoked. This is a powerful message. It's really hit me deep this week. I might shed a few tears. I might fumble through some things. Um, this is not a performance. This is me trying to be as honest and real with what God's been speaking to me. Hopefully it's gonna help someone in here remember how good God is, how much his grace is powerful in our life. And so uh, let's pray together and let's launch. Let's see what he wants to speak to all of us. God, thank you for your word. It's true. We can rest knowing absolute truth every day, connecting with you. And even right now, it's such an honor to take this stage, grab this microphone, open your word. We pray your Holy Spirit would be the teacher today. I would just simply be your representative. I would be a, a conduit which you can flow. So I pray again, I pray I'd get out of the way. I would decrease, you would increase. I pray that your spirit and your scriptures would change us all. I do pray God for attention. I pray that all distractions would flee fertile soil, open hearts, teachable, moldable. 
If there needs to be a chiropractic adjustment from heaven, I pray that you would allow it today. We would relax, receive what you wanna do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if we had a love for Jesus meter that everyone would, it'd be right on your chest and I could look out into the crowd right now and look on mine, I'm wondering what yours would look like. I was thinking of kind of like Iron Man, you know how Iron Man had his like suit and it had to go like up and down with the battery or an iPhone, you know what I'm saying? Like you look at your iPhone after, isn't the best by the way the next morning when you charge your iPhone and it's like 100%. You know, like if I looked out and, and some of you, it's like love for Jesus, it's like ding, 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 it's like, it's like full. Um, I was thinking just this week, when, pe- when we baptize people, by the way, dude, it's, it's the best. Yes. Just this past week, we, did, you know, we had the privilege of baptizing 42 people and for the first time ever, we've been doing this for years, I had the privilege of, I was sitting on like a beach chair just listening to what God has done in people's lives. And I, good thing I had sunglasses on because I'm just, I'm like just weeping, seeing what God has done through so many people's lives. And they're sharing their stories. And they're like, you know, it's not kind of like, yeah, God's good and stuff. Like they are like bragging on God. Like I was broken or I lost a loved one. And, and, and their love, like love for Jesus meters, like it's like this high, you know? And, and, and what it does for me, it kind of brings mine up as well. There's some of us, (laughs) tragically, that the love, if you're really honest, it used to be that 100% meter. But over time, you get busy, get disconnected, forget how much you and I have been forgiven for, and now that passion begins to wane. And instead of just being like full of joy and gratitude and my goodness, the gratefulness ends up switching to criticism and critiquing and judging other people. Maybe someone in your neighborhood, um, they're not, they don't know Jesus and they're kind of on their way, you know, and they're, they're maybe caught up in some different stuff. And instead of actually being so grateful, oh my goodness, God, you give me the ability to go love on that person, now I'm actually starting to judge them. And my love for, for Jesus meter is like, starts going down. Have you been there? I know, I know I have been, and I'll share some of that. Why do I talk about that? Well, today's text, and you already read it, in Luke chapter seven, you read the story of a guy named Simon. Everybody say Simon. Simon the Pharisee. He was this religious leader, this pastor, this priest, and he was hearing about Jesus, and so he invites Jesus over for a meal, which, by the way, Jesus was always eating and hanging with people. Like he would, he would actually invite himself over to people's house for dinner. And uh, I love that about Jesus. And a lot of scholars submit that actually Simon's really jealous of Jesus and so he's trying to trap him as he brings him over for dinner. And so there they are and, and back in that culture, um, they didn't have Facebook or Instagram, but the way they would, um, they would show that they had a featured guest over for a big meal is they, they had like a courtyard with their bigger house and they'd open the gates. And so when the public could walk by, instead of Instagram, they could actually see, oh, it's Jesus. And as they were having a meal, they would allow people to come in and kind of observe what, what was being said and what was happening. So there was this, this, uh, this prostitute And many scholars submit she had just heard Jesus talk about the ability to be forgiven of sin. In fact, they they believe that he preached that message, remember, out of uh, Matthew, I think, when he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Can you imagine this poor prostitute, maybe grown up in an unhealthy, chaotic environment, insecure, doesn't know who she is. And so now she's, or maybe she's desperate to put food on the table for her kids. And she tragically goes into this life of prostitution and sexual morality and walks into it. And she hears this message from Jesus and she's like, oh my goodness, he's he's the featured guest. I'm gonna come in. I'm gonna be able to hear what he has to say. And she walks in 
And now they're breaking bread and they're having this meal. And you read it, right? What does she do? She takes this, this alabaster flask of expensive oil and she breaks it. And now at the feet of Jesus, she's pouring out, she's weeping washing his feet, wiping with her hair that she used to entice her men to come and have relation with her. And what did Simon do? Did you guys read this? This, this hit me so hard, and I'm like, oh my goodness, all of us crusty Christians sometimes get here and we get judgmental. What does it say? It said, Simon said to himself, if this man were truly a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman is touching her. She is a sinner. He said to himself. And I started thinking, you know, and I'll just give you the, the teaching points out front. Y'all ready? Where are my note takers at? Y'all ready? You're like, give me scripture and give me points. I need to write them down. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you asked. Number one, the first thing she does is she brings a present isn't it interesting when we truly experience the forgiveness and grace of God, we can't help but to give back to God. In fact, she brings the most expensive thing she owned and brought it back to Jesus. It's the first thing she did out of gratitude. So you can write it down. And the question we'll ask you here in a couple of minutes is what are we bringing to Jesus lately? So number one is present. Number two is posture. It's so cool. She comes into this place and the first thing she does is kneels down. And it's not just her posture physically, it's her posture emotionally. She is weeping, she is broken over her sin, but also at the same time hopeful that the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, can cleanse her of all unrighteousness. It's a posture. Number three though, there's a problem. The problem is, just like you and I, Simon begins to judge Jesus. You know what's interesting? I was reading this, I was thinking, if, if the Pharisee Simon, the religious pastor, was thrown off so much, he could have just lovingly asked Jesus, Jesus, can you help me understand why you're allowing this woman to touch you? I think a lot of us don't have the cojones to be able just to ask a question to someone. Instead, we talk trash about them. And Simon could have just said, now help me understand this. Remember, Pharisees at the time, they would hold their robe together and when they went out in public, they didn't wanna touch the sinners because the sin would transfer. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're like, and now this woman of the night is touching the feet of Jesus. So let's get into the text. Y'all are like, y'all ready to go, man? They're like, oh, let's go. This guy's fired up today. You know why I am? Because man, I can identify with the sinful woman. I've been forgiven much, I'm gonna love much, and I'm gonna try to help as many people as I can get to experience the grace of God and then spread it throughout this culture. So verse 36, <laughs> let's start in, Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees, Simon, he asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Do you ever get invites for dinner, by the way? Like, look at your iCal right away, and then look at the person inviting you to dinner, and that's how you judge it, you know? I was, I was joking, my, my parents invite me to brunch uh, a lot, and the answer is always yes, because my, my mom makes amazing pancakes, and my stepdad makes these eggs with cheese in them. Oh my goodness. Anybody? Y'all hungry right now, by the way. Did you put, anybody put cheese in your eggs? We call them joach eggs. So I'm like, dude, yes, I am, I am coming over. But you ever been invited over for a dinner and you thought it was out of a genuine heart and they wanted you to be like just blessed? But the, somewhere in the course of the meal, it's not a blessing, it's, a, it's like an investigation of your life. Uh, that's, I think, the picture of this dinner right here. In verse 37, when a certain immoral woman, I underline that in my Bible, identify with her, a, a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with what, church? With expensive perfume. She brought, I underline that, she brought a beautiful jar. It was very expensive. 
this certain immoral woman, a woman of the night, when, um, after I got cut by the New York Jets way back in the 90s, I thought my career was over, the New England Patriots signed me, and they sent me to play football in NFL Europe in a town called Amsterdam. Amsterdam Admirals was my team, which was super interesting because my struggles with sin before I came to Christ were women and weed. And you go to Amsterdam, and it's, it's, all, it's, it's all legal there. And there was a section of the city called the Red Light District. It was super tragic where they would have these sex slaves as prostitutes in these little places. And it was so sad because your, your heart would break over how did they get there? What happened in their life? And that's the picture of what's happening here. This, this certain immoral woman from the Red Light District hears about Jesus and she rolls up. And what does she do? She, she brings this costly perfume, this, this present. And I ask you and I, what have I brought to Jesus lately? What have I given to God? Not out of religious duty, not out of legalism, not out of have to, but get to. Out of a deep revelation of who he is and what he's done for me, it becomes an overflow. I've had this talk recently with people, they're uh, talking about tithing. And I love all these people and they're, and they're working through it and I love it. But really where I get back to it is like, really what's in your heart? What's your understanding of what God's given to you? And here's how I say it. God's given me 100% of what I have financially. He's asked me to bring the first and the best. Are you kidding me? That's the very beginning. I, I, I gladly give you that and more what you've already done in my life. It's not a have to, it's a get to. So, so, so that's, that's, but then it's like give, give you my life, give you my time. I was challenged uh, this recently. And I'm gonna tell you this story. Please don't look at me like he's telling me this so he, they think I, I'm really cool. I'm not telling you this. I'm gonna give you an example. Because it's very, very practical. There's, there's ways to give back to God, not just in your local church, um, volunteering and that kind of stuff. But can I tell you, there are people in our community that are broken and are hurting right now. And when we give to them, the Bible says in Matthew 25, we're actually giving to Jesus. He says, he says when you go visit someone in prison, you're actually visiting him. When you go clothe the poor, when you actually pick up someone that's hurting, you're actually giving back to Jesus. Did you know that? Yeah. Go read it in Matthew 25 for homework. And so this challenge happened recently. I was telling Mike, uh, every Sunday after church, I go and get the, the next study. I get it going. I already have some of it prepared. And, and I'm very like disciplined. I, I'm kind of rain man a little bit with my schedule. So I'm like, no, I gotta get there. And I was driving on the highway and I see this truck it's like 87 degrees out, and there's a guy walking on the highway from this broken down truck. And I feel the Holy Spirit speak to me, hey, uh, I want you to go help this guy. I'm like, but Lord, I'm, I'm, I gotta go study. It's all for you, God, I gotta go study. He's like, this is your study. So I pulled my truck, my little, my little convertible over, and, and the dude comes up, I said, bro, can I help you out? He's like, dude, my car's broke, I think I need some antifreeze. I said, word, like hop in the whip. Dude, I don't want you walking all the way. It's like a mile and a half down the road. It's hot out. Homie pops in. We roll to the gas station. When I get there, I, 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 I'm so not the brightest guy. I, I realize I just had about 50 or 60 bucks cash in my pocket. I never carry cash. Why? I was just at a lunch with one of my generous friends who loves Jesus and knows how much he's been forgiven and he gives back to God out of what God's entrusted to him. We went out to lunch and with the change, he's like, hey, I don't want this change, go give it to someone else. Oh, you gotta be kidding, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So we get the antifreeze and then we come back to his truck and I'm like, that thing ain't gonna start. <laughs> it's not antifreeze, it's batteries on the fritz or something. He's like, you know, and I'm praying, Lord, anoint it with, oil and battery and whatever you need in Jesus' name. And of course, like, he comes back, he's like, bro, I'm so sorry. Like, could you drive me to Fremont? I'm like, going the opposite direction? Uh, absolutely, Jesus, if I'm giving to you, can I, how, how far do you need me to drive you? 
I didn't say that. I don't want to be a weird guy. I'm like, sure, bro. We're good, man. What you need? So we get on the highway. We're going towards Fremont. He's like, actually, I, I, live, uh, I live a couple of towns past Fremont. I'm like, oh, is that right? <laughs> What's so cool is during that time in the car, God speaks to me and says, he's been working through a wound with his father and you need to speak about that real quick. So we walk through being able to have the power to forgive like Jesus forgave us and to forgive our dad. And Jesus is going like, thanks for ministering to me. Thanks for giving back to me. Listen, church, the opportunities to give to Jesus are all over the place. They can be on the highway. They could be next door at your neighbor's house when they're going through a divorce and you're the one not condemning them, but you're coming and bringing them love. There are opportunities. What are we giving back to God? She gives this, this very expensive perfume. And you'll see it later in the text. In that culture, when you would walk into a home, the normal thing you would do is you would take some expensive oil and you would put it, you would anoint their head. They're funky and gnarly, so that's what you would do. And this woman probably because of the resources of her profession, has earned this, and now she's bringing her first and best right to the Lord. Such a powerful thing. So what are we giving? Number one, present. Number two, her posture. Everybody say posture. posture. This is key. Look at verse 38. So, so <laughs> she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell. I was studying this in the Greek. The word for fall right there is brecho. It actually is the same word for rain. So literally her, her tears are raining out of her eyes. Really, it's a picture of her heart broken over her sin. And she, they're raining down many times, man, in worship. Uh, it, you know, <laughs> Josh and these guys are making fun of me all the time because I'm like going right to the tissue. Why is that? It's in worship. You're broken, and, and, and you're like, God, I can't believe you've forgiven me. Not just for all the gnarly stuff I've done, but even the dumb stuff I do today. Hello. I, I, was, I was with my, one of my best friends who was in town that I went out to lunch with, and we were both, <laughs> we've been just forgiven for so much, and we were just on the front row, just weeping and worshiping last week. Here we are 16 years later, listen, that couple that was with us, when we first started the church at Kiewit Middle School, the woman was our, one of our worship leaders at Kiewit Middle School in the lunchroom, hello, and my, my, one of my best friends was the backup preacher. He'd come from his corporate world, he'd be like sweating all week, like preparing a Bible study. None of us had jobs or, you know, or none of us had, were employed by the church. We just came, why, man? Because we just were broken and we were like, God, you could forgive us this much? How can we help someone else? And there was this posture. And it says this, she wiped them off with her hair. The, once again, this, this gift that God had given her in her hair and her beauty that she was using it in the wrong way. Now she's actually using it to wipe the son of man's feet. And then the Bible says, then she kept kissing his feet. Golly, how about that, church? Can we just keep kissing Jesus' feet? Not just when we first get saved. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. You're like, dude, what is, I, let, me give a, let me give you a picture. Pastor Josh, can you just grab me those, those pillows real quick, please, thanks. Because you're like, wait, she, she, how did she get underneath the table to put oil on his feet and all that kind of stuff? Well, in that culture, they didn't have like dinner tables with chairs they would sit on. What they had was they would actually lounge like this and their feet would kind of be behind them doing one of these numbers. And there would be like some type of bowl of gravy or sauce or something in the middle. And they'd tear off like a big chunk of bread. And it wasn't like, you know how it's totally full paw to like double dip, you know, when you're out to eat with someone, you know, it's like chips and like queso. It's like, bro, break it off. And, you know, don't do the double dip. They'd do double dip, triple dip, quadruple dip. 
know what I'm saying? They'd be doing their thing and lounging, and their feet would be behind. So just picture this. Like Jesus is hanging with Simon, the rest of the crew. I mean, this is a big deal, Instagram. And now, all of a sudden, the woman who shouldn't be touching the prophet brings this expensive oil, and she's anointing his feet. She's weeping. That's the posture that she has. And I started thinking of, my goodness, like, what's my posture? What's my posture before Jesus? I mean, did, have I lost my first love? Has I, have I lost, lost the emotion connected to who he is? Am I humble before him? Am I prideful? I, I wrote this in my notes. You can jot it down. I, I said this, humility is connected to eternity. And this posture of humility is just a representative of her heart. I just, <laughs> the more I go on in this journey with Jesus, I feel like pride and Jesus are two mutually exclusive ideas. And her heart is connected. It, it is before the Lord. Her posture is, is the posture of heaven. I like studying the book of Revelation because you get like a, um, a, a glimpse of what heaven's gonna look like. And, uh, and you'll see it in, in the book of Revelation. Go study it. You'll see these like crazy angels and they're worshiping God. They're like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And every time they start singing, it says that the elders, what do they do? They fall down and worship the one who sits on the throne. That's the position of heaven. So <laughs> picture this. You got this pastor, priest, religious leader. Jesus has come in. He hasn't washed the feet. He hasn't anointed the head. He hasn't done anything. And now we see this broken woman who is partnering with the heaven. And now she's like, well, if Simon ain't gonna wash his feet, if he, if he ain't gonna anoint the oil, guess what? I will. And she comes with this, this brokenness over her sin. And the response, that's why I like, I don't really like forcing you to raise your hands. I don't like forcing you to clap your hands or to dance. But here's what I do like. I like when the spontaneous flow of God's gratitude comes out of you and you can't help but raise your hands. You can't help but sing or shout at the top of your lungs because your understanding of what he's done for you is motivating you and flying out of your mouth, out of your being. This posture, this posture. Everybody say posture. I can identify with this woman. I can identify with her. And maybe sexual sin isn't anything you've ever struggled with, but I can understand that. I, I can understand going outside of God's best. I always thought that, you know, that whole area, God was just restrictive. Why are you restricting me? I, you know, really wasn't restricting me. He was protecting me. But I said, bump you, God. I'm gonna do my own thing in this way. And what ended up happening when I was a junior in high school, got a woman pregnant and paid for an abortion. That's what happened when you go outside of God's best. So I can relate to being broken before God. I can relate to being grateful that as far as the east is from the west, so has he forgiven me for that sin. He, the Bible says he chooses to remember it no more. Even though I remember it, he doesn't. Why? Because it was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, it is finished, to tell us die, he meant it because he paid for it. I bring it up to him. He's like, what y'all talking about? You already repented of that. You already asked me for forgiveness. Why do you keep on doing that? Why do you keep on remembering that and going back to it? Just this week, I remember the two girls that came to, bring, to get money from me to go bring to her friend. It wrecked me again. So when you see me coming in here and worshiping my guts out and broken before him, please don't say, oh, he's on a show again. Please don't do that because you don't know why I'm so grateful for what he has done. My wife went through the same thing, and guess what? We have twin boys. You talk about the grace of God. I can, I can identify with King David. You remember King David's story? King David knew how to worship God. 
King David, one of the greatest kings of Israel, God's chosen people, doing amazing things. And then a weak moment, what does he do? He was supposed to be out with all of his homies as kings would be in the spring at battle. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna be chilling during the battle. Y'all take it. So what was, he was on, back in that day in Israel, they had these rooftop kind of pools and hanging out, and he was like chilling, like getting some sun. Had a little siesta, woke up from siesta, he looked over across, he's like, oh, dang, who's that? This hottie named Bathsheba, he's like, yo, Bathsheba, sent her a text, yo, come over to King Dave. You know the story tragically gives into his flesh, actually gets her pregnant, calls for her husband to come back from the battlefield, gets him drunk, tries to have him go back and sleep with his wife to kind of cover it up. The dude had so much honor, he's like, I ain't leaving my friends, no way. When my friends are sweating and toiling, I'm going back to the battlefield. What does David do? Oh my goodness, I gotta do something about it. I know what I'll do. I'll just have him killed. Actually, he has him on the front line, commands the troops to go away, and, and that husband of Bathsheba, Uriah, is killed. So not only does he commit adultery, he commits murder. Can you imagine? What do you do before God? The guilt, the shame, the brokenness. Nathan the prophet calls him out and David comes to this place and then he pens Psalm 51 out of a broken and contrite heart. And I'm tell, I'll, 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 let me just read you verse 14 of Psalm 50. Go study it. If you are struggling with some of your, your past choices and you can identify with this message, go back to Psalm 51, verse 14. It says, forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will what, church? I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Come on, is anybody grateful for the forgiveness of God? No matter what you have done, I'm singing. And then in verse 17 says, the sacrifice you desire, watch this, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. In another translation, it says a broken and contrite spirit. That's the spirit. Never forgetting how much he has done for us. Never forgetting the depths of sin that he pulled you out of. In your worst moment, he said, you know what? While he was still sinning, Christ died for the ungodly. And now this posture remains humble before God. Keep kissing him. Keep worshiping him in your daily life. Let it flow. So we have giving back to God through this present. She's broken. She brings this alabaster flask of oil, expensive oil. She has the right posture but now we shift towards Simon and we got a problem. <laughs> Houston, we got a, we got a problem. Luke 7, now verse 39, listen to what it says. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, and that, please underline this in your Bible, particularly if you struggle with legalism or judging people or looking at flaws in others, but not yourself. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Again, Pharisees didn't have any, like they're, they're like, no, dude, don't do this. She is a what? She is a sinner. Let me ask this question. Are you struggling like Simon right now, talking about other people, judging other people, without actually having the humility to ask, can you help me understand? Are you seeing it maybe in people you hang out with? It just seems like, man, all you do is criticize and critique and judge people. And in a world of division like never before, I'm praying for a church, man, that walks with humility, with tact. There's people out there that don't know any better. Instead of judging them, we need to love them. There's something that needs to shift, and it's happening, and I love, I love seeing Many of you, it's happening. But man, I struggle with it sometimes. I, one indicator is uh, recently I was traveling and um, I was judging someone 
who didn't know airplane etiquette, uh, specifically airplane deboarding etiquette. You guys know it, may, and maybe if you don't, if you're younger out here, you don't fly a lot, let me give you just a little tra- quick training, if you don't mind. Is that okay if I give you a little quick training? When you're deplaning, it's, it's always let the person um, in front of you go, okay? Then you, pick, then you get up, you, you grab what suitcase or whatever up. In fact, grab someone for someone else. Make sure you get them. Let, and then the, if, <laughs> it's always weird too. If like your row is exactly parallel with the other person's row, let them go first as well, right? But man, there's some people that are like three or four rows back and they like immediately get up, grab everything and just, just they, mm, and then just stop. And I'm like, bruh. I mean, Sorry, if I've, if I've given that anointing to you of legalism, but here's what God spoke to me recently. It's really, it was actually really, really good. I was judging someone that, that, that was doing that. My wife wanted to educate them. I wanted to judge them, you know, and uh, both consultants, hey, we're in process like y'all, and the Lord spoke to me. How do you know that that woman's mom isn't on her deathbed and she's trying to get there before she takes her last breath. I said, Lord, forgive me. I said, hey, anyone else need to go before me? Go ahead, go ahead. I'm good, I'm staying here, man. I'm not in a hurry, all ready to go. I've seen it show up in different areas. Merging traffic, I was in Fort Lauderdale recently. Fort Lauderdale, you know Fort Lauderdale traffic, terrible. And you know when there's like a lane that's gonna merge? Lane is going to end. And they're, I didn't know there's supposed to be a zipper thing. I didn't know the the rule. Remember us talking about this? So meanwhile, sometimes I'll try to like get in the other lane and kind of box everybody out because in my mind, these, these idiots are going past me and causing me to wait another 20 minutes. I didn't know that's what they're supposed to do. Did you know that? Did, I don't, so I've been educating you the wrong way. No, you're supposed, so you see it? We all go as fast as we can and then we zipper. Like right there. I'm boxing people out like a legalist. Like, by the way, uh, you, might, you might be a Pharisee if that's what you're starting to do. I was thinking of Jeff Foxworthy. Um, you might be a redneck if... Uh, can I just give you a couple of them real quick? Maybe just a little comic relief on a Sunday. Is that okay? You guys remember that? You might be a, uh, a redneck if you clip your toenails in front of company. <laughs> your Tamara's never done that good. Uh, how about this one? Um, you might be a redneck if your best couch is on the front porch. Hey, hey. You guys ready for one more? What, just one. Two more. Can I give you two more? All right. Uh, You might be a redneck if your house doesn't have curtains, but your vehicle does. (laughs) And this is my favorite, best for last. You might be a redneck if you think a subdivision is part of a math problem. (laughs) That's so good. Oh, dude. Sorry. interesting because I've been checked by God on this. And some of us Christians, we start off like the sinful woman weeping before the Lord's feet. We're bringing him our first and best. We're bringing our whole life. And then in the busyness of life or getting disconnected, we become judgmental. We start talking about other people. And now what, what happened? The love for Jesus meter was 100 and now it's waning and it's, and it's down. And this man, Simon, he, he's, he's talking about this, this woman who actually is representing heaven, humble before Jesus' feet. Reminds me of the story that, that Jesus talked about with the, another Pharisee and a tax collector. You remember that story where the Pharisee and the tax collector, they come to pray, and the Pharisee is praying, and the, here's how the, you might be a Pharisee if this sounds like your prayer. The prayer is this, oh God, thank you so much that I'm not like that guy. Thank you that I give so much to you. Thank you that I don't do that. 
And thank you that I'm not like that stinky tax collector. You might be, have pharisaical tendencies if that's what your prayer sounds like. We've all been there. No judgment, just adjustment right now. Let the Holy Spirit adjust your spirit and my spirit. But then the tax collector came to pray, the same thing. What did he do? He beat his breast, the Bible says, and he said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. The Bible says that that man went home justified, not the Pharisee, not the priest, not the pastor. That's this humility, that's the posture. (laughs) So Jesus, the absolute heavenly gangster, like knows what he's thinking and responds in a story, and this is where we'll begin to land the plane, verse 40. Jesus answered his thoughts, which is so cool. Like, he knows your thoughts, by the way. He answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. And like, I'm like, yes, see, let him have it, Jesus. Set him straight, the Pharisee and me. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Verse 41, then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver, let's call it 50 grand, to one, and then 50 pieces to the other, let's call it five grand. But neither of them could repay him. They hit tough times, circumstances hit, they they just, they went bankrupt, They, they could not repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Wouldn't that be great if your mortgage company called you, by the way, it was like, hey, Bank of America just called. Hey, by the way, I just decided just to forgive you of your, of your mortgage. But listen to this question. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? I have a friend that is, uh, he had applied for student loan relief forgiveness. And I was thinking about, oh my goodness, that's perfect. Can you imagine, like, you, man, you have 50 grand of student debt out there, some of you guys have five, and both of you are forgiven, your, 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 uh, your student loan is gone. I'm just looking, I was thinking, there's gonna be two different parties that are happening after that. <laughs> One is gonna be like hanging out with like the parents, being like, dude, this was sweet, five grand, this is awesome, man, I can maybe put it down on a down payment on a house, or whatever. The person that got <laughs> released 50 grand, bringing all the homies, man. <laughs> like, Yo! And I started thinking, man, that's a perfect picture of both of us, isn't it? The fact is, I don't care if you're a pro sinner or an amateur sinner, we've all been forgiven. We were on our way to hell and all of us are now, as Christians, going to heaven. The only difference, check this out, is not the amount or the heinous of sin, it's the awareness of the sin. Those are (laughs) two different things. And I don't know about you, man, but I'm telling you, I'm the chief of sinners. I just told you, man, my worst sin and many more on top of that. And guess what? God's forgiven all of them. There's a party that happens. Again, imagine someone, your mortgage company calls you and says, dude, your your $500,000 mortgage is gone. You think you'd be like on the phone? You imagine telling your wife or your, your husband after that, hey, I just got a call just from uh, the mortgage company, and you wouldn't believe it. They said, that 500 grand? No, don't worry about it. Hallelujah, so we should grab a Chick-fil-A, a a little waffle fries, what do you think? (laughs) Tragically, somehow we forgot as Christians, man, what we've been forgiven, here's what we come into church. Oh man, they didn't, uh, I don't know if I'll go to church today. I don't know, it's kinda cool, whatever. Jesus did some cool stuff, I guess, and stuff. I didn't really like that song. That song, that was a little old. It's kind of redundant. I, man, I don't know about that song. I, that's kind of played out. I don't know if they should play that one anymore. I'll tell you what, Austin sweats a lot. That guy, I don't know about him. <laughs> Who's, Todd, Todd, does he have any other message than grace? I, man, I don't know. I'm messing with y'all, by the way, but, but, but on one side, Could it be some of us are at that 20% and God's just wanting to get us back to that 100% love for Jesus, recognize the revelation of what he has paid for, 
walking in freedom. Anybody grateful for the grace of God today? Let's pray. God, thank you for this 